Before I actually start, though, talking about samplers, what's interesting about the whole occasion for me is, like most things like this, it's made me reflect reflect on the past and certainly reflect on education and my own education. So 30 seconds is just going to be about me, but also about samplers, because I was reminded that when I went to school, to secondary school, when I was 11 in 1960, when I went to school then, every single girl in my school had to make a sampler. Um, and I brought for you to see, I thought you'd be thrilled to see this. <laughs> I brought, I kept it amazingly. And we all had to make a, a, a teapot stand. Um, what a delightful thing, as you can see. And they all, 35, 11-year-old girls in the grammar school, all made exactly the same thing, same material. We had to do the same stitches. The only difference was that you could decide where to put the stitches. And I was looking at this this morning with my husband. I obviously decided I must have had an artistic bent even then because they are rather abstractly put around. So I think, anyway, so we had to all make a sample. For those of you who are as old as me, you'll know that when you went to school anywhere at 11, everybody in a girls' school had to do domestic science, and domestic science was cookery and needlework, and of course it was to make us all jolly good housewives, and I think that's quite a good way of putting it, a jolly good housewife. Anyway, the difference between this sampler and the ones I'm going to show you that were done in the 19th century in schools in Carmarthenshire is that these that I did, or the ones that we did, had to be useful. Whereas the ones in the 19th century, which, I, as I say, I'm going to show you, were about showing off and saying, look at me, I've learnt this at school, this proves that I've been a really good student and I've understood what my teachers told me. So that's the main thing I'm going to talk to you about. Um, bear with me just a second when I get on to the... Hmm. Am I there? Yes, I am there. <coughs> this is obviously just the first one. Right. The first slide is just for, the, for most people of my age group or older than me know what a sampler is or they know what a 19th century sampler looked like. For, for other people, why should they know what a sampler looked like? But basically, for those of, the do, those of us that do know, those of us that don't know, people's image of a sampler tends to be from the 19th century, something done at school, something made to be put in a frame, something to show that you knew your alphabet you knew about numbers, they often have a picture of a building, they nearly always have a religious verse. The idea being, of course, that if you learnt the Bible, you sat for hours embroidering a religious, a religious verse, you'd end up a better person, which I'm sure you did. Uh, except I know some of the samplers in Kamala Museum of this particular period, where you've got little girls of nine religiously embroidering these great long verses of prayers against passion does seem a little bit unkind and mean. But the idea was that the more miserable you were, somehow or other it would make you a better person. And I'm certainly not suggesting that every verse in the Bible is miserable. Please, please note. Anyway, a classic sampler, pretty border, done at school, in the frame, yippee, look at me, aren't I clever, I've learnt all this. But samplers, and I'm going to do a very, very, very quick, even though Laura and I were saying we've never spoken on our particular areas of interest for 15 minutes before, so I'm going to really gallop through the centuries. But for those of you not familiar with what samplers actually were to start with, they were basically exemplars, exemplars or samples of stitchery to be used as a reference point. And the earliest dated sampler in Britain is this particular one by <coughs> Jane Brigstock, which is dated, as you can probably see, 1598 but it doesn't look anything like the one I showed you just now this wasn't done to be put in a frame it was basically random examples of embroidery that could, that could be used and I'm not suggesting it was quite like this but if you were making a garment you'd say oh I wonder what stitches I can use and you'd look at your examples that are here so it's examples samples of stitchery Hundred years later, and that's why I'm saying we're running through the centuries. A century later was when samplers really became precious, precious objects. This is a very particular type of sampler called a band sampler, and they were only about this wide and about this long. I would imagine probably a yard or a metre long, and they were kept rolled up on a little ivory rod. And these samplers were so precious because the needlework was so careful and, of course, silk was incredibly expensive at this particular time. They were kept rolled up on this little ivory, ivory rod, kept in a big 
case usually with all the precious linens of the household and they were often left in wills and in fact in the records office in Carmarthen you can see two estate family wills where both the family waistcoats and the family samplers were actually passed on through the generations so incredibly important of that period hundred years later they're still not this is it's a mid 1700s, not square like the one I showed you before, but not as skinny and long. This is one of my favourite samplers in Wales, it's from Llandrin Wells Museum, and the reason I love it so much is samplers nearly always have Adam and Eve on and the tree of life, very common symbols obviously to do with re religious, but the reason this particular sampler is so fantastic, A, it's got these slightly mad sheep as you can see, um, and amazingly the rabbits and the sheep in Llandrin Dodwells all seem to be the same size but the other thing that's fantastic about this one is I'll never forget when I went to see it I went to see it years ago when I worked at Kamala Museum and what is so fantastic is uh, Adam and Eve have got little appliqued fig leaves that lift up <laughs> which I think is Anyway, I digress slightly. On to the point. I just felt it was worth pointing out that when these beautiful silk, in, silk samplers were made and put on the little ivory rods and put in the, in, the, in the caskets, they weren't, I have to say, I'm being presumptuous now, they weren't exactly for the likes of us. This is when embroidery was about wealth and power. And certainly centuries before, it was all about the church. So we're talking about the people that made those were either professional embroiderers often men, I hasten to add, um, but they, they are, had these stitches as examples because this is the kind of thing that was made. Fantastic silk embroidered waistcoats and very exotic and beautiful bed hangings. So we're talking here about money and we're talking here about wealth and we're talking about status. And on that very subject, which reminds me, going back to what I did with my teapot stand, is certainly in the early centuries, in the 13th, the 12th and 13th centuries, when embroidery in Britain was so famous, it was nearly always done by men. So when embroidery and sampler making was a high art, men did it. As soon as it became a more domestic activity, oh whoops, it became a craft because women did it. So, um, in fact, the very first guild in Britain was the Broderers Guild, the Embroiderers Guild. So it's something which is part of our heritage, which is actually rather important and rather special, sorry. This one is a 17th century one, an 18th century one again, beginning to be squarey. This is actually from Penarth. I've only included this because it's very, very noticeable samplers in different parts of Wales. I call them the Newport style, and I mean Newport Gwent, because most of the samplers made there are nearly always embroidered with very beautiful silks, whereas a lot of the ones embroidered in Carmarthenshire are embroidered on woolen cloth, woolen tammy cloth made on local looms and embroidered with wool. So you can very much tell over the centuries where the samplers were made depending on what they were actually made with. I love this particular sampler because it's slightly eccentric, rather mad, and I do love the fact that the girl that made this didn't actually use a pattern book to have her people illustrated. She drew them, which is why they're quite naive. Also, the thing that's fantastic about this particular one is they are wearing contemporary dress of the period, so it's an extra thing about samplers. This next one, which you can probably see from the date, is also 19th century, 1833. Now, it was at the end of the 18th century, about 1790s, when it was it's first recorded that samplers started to be made in some of the board schools that then existed. And they were made specifically to show and introduce girls to prove that they knew numeracy, literacy, they had some knowledge of the Bible, as I said before, and some ability to use a needle. And for a lot of working girls in an area like Carmarthen, when they started to do them in schools, this was very important because they weren't being trained to embroider garments for themselves. They were being trained to, to embroider onto linens when they were being laundered and working in big houses. So they were done for a slightly different reason. I think this is fantastic. I love this one. It's actually done on linen and it's done with, with linen thread. But it also, if you can see in the alphabet, it's also starting to experiment with different kinds of embroidery stitches. And I have to say, I'm very happy afterwards to answer any questions about the stitches, but my particular interest is the social history of samplers and not actually 
the way that they're stitched. Again, this is also a favourite one of mine of the period, and this is really mad because she really hasn't, she really has, she's got, she's got a border probably taken from a book, but she's decided, oh, blow it. And I particularly like um, Noah and his wife and the three sons and, and the dog that you can see here. Some of the images on this particular sampler are actually taken. You do remember years ago, many, or some of you may, when magazines like Woman's Realm used to give away free, they were like blue on tracing paper that you ironed onto material and then you embroidered a tablecloth. Well, at this particular period, which is um, the, the early 19th century, you could actually buy those patterns to use. But I like this because, A, she's actually gone a bit bonkers on the skirt of the lady, <laughs> and also this incredibly abstract and rather bizarre landscape at the top. So whilst we think of them as the sampler I showed you at the beginning of being very regimented, there were times when young women thought, oh, blow it, and went a little bit mad. <laughs> Of all the samplers in the 19th century made in schools in Carmarthenshire, this must be the creme de la creme. And this particular sampler is in a collection of Carmarthen Museum. It's about this big, the sampler, in a very deep frame. So in fact, the whole thing's this size, very, very unusual. It's absolutely huge. It is so special of the time that when Batsuds were producing a new book on the history of British samplers, this is the sampler that was on the cover of that book. It's absolutely gorgeous. You've got everything that you wanted. Adam and Eve and no clothes on, of course, and definitely no little fig leaves that you can, you can lift up. Made in Mrs Hughes's school, fantastic verse, very rigid and form, very interesting, not much free work, but having said that, she's constructed it so beautifully. But this sampler, more than any that I think I've ever seen, really does say, look at me. And you can imagine this hanging in a, in a home in Carmarthen, because it's actually from Carmarthen, the pride of place to show what this daughter has been doing at school. It's also quite possible in Mrs Hughes's school, which was in Carmarthen, that many of the pupils in the school will have produced a sampler which looked almost exactly the same as well. They did occasionally tend to follow each other. But for me, that is the classic sampler. And I understand when I was still working at Carmarthen Museum, Sotheby's came to value all the samplers. And one of the things that came out of that valuation is that some of the ones in Carmarthen, A, they're very unusual because of their size, and also a lot of them have a very particular acorn and oak leaf pattern around the edges. So for those of you who are fascinated by pattern, they are very special. So here we have these young women in school. Sometimes they go on to be pupil teachers, and they're not all eight-year-olds. They're often 13-year-olds doing this in school as an exercise. Boys didn't do this, of course. They were doing woodwork or playing football or exciting things like that. So we're, there we have all these young women sitting there, stitching away, um, making sure they understood about stitchery techniques, etc. But one of the things for me that is so incredible is, you think of most museums you've ever been in, how many things do you actually see made by women? Not that many. Fantastic furniture made by men. There is very, very, very little that you go in, apart from the odd garment, you know, clothing, you see made by women. But the reason these things are are fascinating is it isn't just that they're made by women they are the most amazing social history documents so for instance whilst this might look like a classic 19th century sampler made at school here we have all the information on there she's 13 you know her mother and father we've got everything it was where it was the national school in new church oh fantastic but what is even more fantastic is this school no longer exists this is the only visual record anywhere of this particular place. Pre-photography, pre a fantastic social document. Equally, this little one here, which is from St David's, I just happened to come across this and I thought I'd toss it in. Um, you often see churches on them as well. So, and in fact, in McCuntleth, I was recording samplers years ago, and there's a sampler in McCuntleth which actually records the entire high street with all the shops. Um, it doesn't look terribly different than it does now, actually. But again, from a social history point of view, very interesting. Also, you sometimes see buildings. You know, you've got the classic sampler look, little verse. Um, not an alphabet on this one. It's a little bit later, mid-19th century. Lovely strawberry border, little birds in cages, all terribly delightful. But what is this building in the middle? Who knows? Somebody one day is going to tell me. You know, it doesn't look like anything else. I'm sure this girl, it's either the school that she was at... Um, or it's, or it's the farm that she lived in. Fantastic. Again, the only record of that particular place. This particular one, again done at school, in the collection of the uh, Museum of Welsh Life at St Fagans, or sorry, the National History Museum at St Fagans, um, um, gave her a wedding in Cymru. 
this classic of the borders, all done in silks, very expensive, but what do you see in the middle? You may see religious things, you may see an owl, you may see the virgin, you may see little bits from, from the Bible, but right in the centre is a hot air balloon. And this particular sampler was done the year that the first hot air balloon went across the channel to France. So how fantastic. You know, she obviously thought, oh right, there we are then. What else is there? So she thought she'd pop that on too. Again, so they can commemorate events. This one again is in Kamada Museum. It's a very big sampler, made at school, absolutely delightful. Quite unusual to see boats on samplers. You quite often see them, let's say for the sake of example, you'd see them in Aberystwyth. The National Library has got a very interesting collection of samplers, amazingly, and one of the ones they've got there is, has got a ship on it, but it's also is a commemorative sampler which records the father of the young woman who made it, who died at sea. So he drowned, he was a sailor in Aberystwyth, ship on the sampler, dies at sea, and then in one corner she had squiggled in tiny little embroidery because both her brothers subsequently died at sea as well. So she actually included them on the sampler. So actually quite sort of heart-rending. Now this particular one, I love this. Margaret Davis was quite old when she did this. She was actually 19. It's thought that she was working in a school as a pupil teacher. Um, and also her brother, we think, was one of the little boys who actually was on this ship. I particularly like this one, partly because of its size, but also it just goes to show that sometimes when they embroidered, they thought, what the hell? She'd embroidered it and she could, it's, it was actually called the Princess Royal, this ship. Well, she obviously thought, oh, blow this, I can't, I haven't got room here. So she's just done it as Prince. She hasn't put Princess. And also, if you read it, a lot of her letters are back to front. So she'd reached the point where I think she thought, I am not unpicking all this. I'll just carry on regardless. Tree of Life at the top. Fantastic sampler. A record of a particular time and a particular place. Also, samplers and then the need for stitchery, whilst... I showed you right at the very beginning, and this really is a gallop through history, um, those fantastic um, silk waistcoats. I think this is one of my most favouritest things in the collection of Kamada Museum. Far better examples than they've got at St Fagans or in the Victorian Albert Museum. And this is a pair of pockets, and they almost look like a sampler, don't they? They're made of Welsh flannel, obviously woven locally, and they were, bought, they were worn, they were made by and worn by <coughs> excuse me, Mary Davis, as you can see on here, and it's fantastically well recorded in the ancient um, accessions register at Carmarthen Museum. And Mary Davis had a flannel stall in Carmarthen Market. And she had, she'd wear this when she was on the stall. And I have actually got a photograph, not of her, but of a stall. But that's for another time. But it's recorded that she had one pocket for copper and one pocket for silver. Mm -hmm. And when you turn them over, they're lined on the back with pillow ticking. And obviously the one for copper is quite darned, but the one for silver isn't. <laughs> but what a nice... So a lovely, lovely story. Good old Mary Davis. Um, I know that my 15 minutes is nearly up, so I'm beginning to, to race along. I particularly wanted to show you a couple of 19th century ones made in school as well, because what's quite interesting is, bearing in mind that these 19th century samplers made in school, part of the national curriculum in inverted commas, at a time of the Welsh knot, of all the things that were done in school that um, school inspectors saw in 1847, the only time they ever record things being written in Welsh is samplers. And the idea of reading the Bible through the media of Welsh and English and embroidering on a sampler in Welsh was not actually forbidden at all, in fact quite encouraged. Um, and before I actually finish, I've just got two more images, I just wanted to read you very quickly. One of my great heroes... I'm sure some of you know of him. One of my great heroes when I first came to work in museums many years ago was a chap called Francis Payne, who uh, actually worked as a volunteer at Carmarthen Museum for a period. Anyway, he was a fantastic curator at St Fagans, and he did the most wonderful, wonderful work on the te textile collection there. Um, and for instance, just to give you an idea of, of, of what was going on in schools at this time, and a lot of this information, by the way, is in the records office in Carmarthen, but rather than go and root it all out, I thought you wouldn't mind if I read it from his book. Um, He's talking about how children worked on samplers at school. The first sampler is marked with red cotton. The second is composed of finer materials, possibly silk. The children are divided into three classes. Every child, when she enters a school, is placed in the third class. The third class sampler has back, chain, darning, besting, herringbone, marking, overcast, buttonhole 
and eyelet hole stitch upon it. When the child has practiced these on the third class sampler, she makes them accurately on the second class sampler. The first class merely prepares for the lower classes and does more elaborate work itself, such as the embroidering of garments for which the sampler provided the model. So that's actually quite a succinct. This is actually from a, a, a sampler a book in the 1850s. But the bit I particularly wanted to quickly read for you is um, he's looking at this, the, 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 the rather notorious, as you probably know better than I do, the very notorious report of the Commissioners of Inquiry into the State of Education in Wales of 1847, um, and it was very notorious. But anyway, he sa it says in this report about sampler making in Carmarthenshire schools. Mrs. Suet's reading and sewing school held in a thatched house nearly opposite the church. This is in Clan Stephan. The copies were written tolerably well and the samplers were very good. Uh, Lax Welsh School in Carmarthen, which was a Welsh language school in Carmarthen, the, the promoters object being to teach them to read the Welsh and English Bibles and to sew, knit and spin. So they were doing that a lot in Carmarthen at the time. Carmarthen also, Woods Row Sewing and Reading School, the elder girls work samplers which appeared very good. And lastly, Miss Humphrey provides the girls with canvas for working samplers and materials for different articles of clothing which in course of time are awarded as prizes for good conduct and diligence. So this sort of, it, it says about you know, sewing is important because you've got to do it, but it also says that sitting still for long periods of time is actually very good for you and builds the character. Um, and sorry, that last sampler was just to show that there are many samplers done at school, which this one was, which have their verses through the medium of Welsh. Uh, my last two images now. I'm sorry this is such a terrible slide, but this one is in the collection of Carmarthen Museum. You can see that the, um, the verse is in Welsh. Many years ago I did a programme on Women's Hour on Radio 4 about Welsh samplers, and I had lots of letters at Carmarthen Museum, and a lady from England sent me a photograph of a sampler, and she said that she knew her family were from somewhere in West Wales, but she had no, no idea where. Now, the sampler that she sent me was almost identical to this one, except the two little figures were around the other way. Now, I know that this sampler was made at a school in Llangadog, so I was making me go all tingly saying, I was able to write back to this lady to tell her where her family came from. So that sort of reinforces for me that samplers are very special things. They were done for a purpose that they have many social history aspects to them. This little one, many samplers in this area were produced as commemorative samplers, obviously to do with death. And this is a little tiny one, which you can see uh, commemorates two, two deaths. These particular ones are often made in chapels as opposed to schools. And you can read it and see what it says. I can show you after if you want. My very last one then on the subject of samplers as a whole. This is, this is, whilst it may not be the most beautiful sampler in the whole world, it is actually from Carmarthen Museum down at Abergwilly. <coughs> and I think the verse on this sums up for me why they really are fantastic and so important and I shall read it for you forgive me nice border by the way note acorn and oak leaves it says Anne Thomas is my name <coughs> excuse me Anne Thomas is my name whale well she forgot the Esther. whale is my nation Abergwilly is my dwelling place and Christ is my salvation when I am dead and in my grave and all bo bones are rotten on this sampler you will find my name when I'm quite forget <laughs> now, <laughs> now was she going to unpick it all and put forgotten I think not um, <coughs> the, re the, the reason I love it so much is she isn't forgotten her sampler is in the collection of Kamada Museum and what a special thing that is that we have fantastic examples of women's art but we also have a way of people waving to us from the past saying hello I was here and oh sorry it was more than 50 minutes <laughs> sorry <laughs>